The history of the Maldives is intertwined with the history of the broader Indian subcontinent and the surrounding regions, comprising the areas of South Asia and Indian Ocean, and the modern nation consisting of 26 natural atolls, comprising 1,194 islands. Historically, the Maldives had a strategic importance because of its location on the major marine routes of the Indian Ocean. The Maldives' nearest neighbors are Sri Lanka and India, both of which have had cultural and economic ties with Maldives for centuries. The Maldives provided the main source of cowrie shells, then used as a currency throughout Asia and parts of the East African coast. Most probably Maldives were influenced by Kalingas of ancient India who were earliest sea traders to Sri Lanka and Maldives from India and were responsible for the spread of Buddhism. Hence ancient Hindu culture has an indelible impact on Maldives local culture. After the 16th century, when colonial powers took over much of the trade in the Indian Ocean, first the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and the French occasionally meddled in local politics. However, this interference ended when the Maldives became a British protectorate in the 19th century and the Maldivian monarchs were granted a good measure of self-governance. The Maldives gained total independence from the British on July 26, 1965. However, the British continued to maintain an air base on the island of Gaon in the southernmost atoll until 1976. The British departure in 1976 at the height of the Cold War almost immediately triggered foreign speculation about the future of the air base. Apparently the Soviet Union made a move to request the use of the base, but the Maldives refused. The greatest challenge facing the Republic in the early 1990s was the need for rapid economic development and modernization, given the country's limited resource base and fishing, agriculture and tourism. Concern was also evident over a projected long-term sea level rise, which would prove disastrous to the low-lying coral islands. Early Age these first Maldivians did not leave any archaeological remains. Their buildings were probably built of wood, palm fronds and other perishable materials, which would have quickly decayed in the salt and wind of the tropical climate. Moreover, chiefs or headmen did not reside in elaborate stone palaces, nor did their religion require the construction of large temples or compounds. Comparative studies of Maldivian oral, Linguistic and cultural traditions and customs indicate that one of the earliest settlers were descendants of Tamils from ancient Tamilicum in the Sangam period, most probably fishermen from the southwest coasts of present India and the northwestern shores of Sri Lanka. One such community are the Jaravaru people. They are mentioned in ancient legends and local folklore about the establishment of the capital and kingly rule in Mali. Depictions of these early societies see, according to some, a matriarchal society with each atoll ruled by a chief queen according to some accounts or by others, several theocratic societies ruled by priests known as Saimias of Heliolatric, Selenolatric and Astrolatric religions. Several foreign travelers, mainly Arabs, had written about a kingdom of the Maldives ruled over by a queen. Al-Idrisi, referring to earlier writers, mentions the name of one of the queens, Damahar, who was a member of the Adiata dynasty. A strong underlying layer of Dravidian population and culture survives in Maldivian society, with a clear Tamil Malayalam substratum in the language, which also appears in place names, kinship terms, poetry, dance, and religious beliefs. Malabari seafaring culture led to Malayali settling of the Lakadives, and the Maldives were evidently viewed as an extension of that archipelago. Some argue that Sindhus also accounted for an early layer of migration. Seafaring from Dabal began during the Indus Valley Civilization. The Jadakas and Puranas show abundant evidence of this maritime trade, the use of similar traditional boat-building techniques in northwestern South Asia and the Maldives, and the presence of silver punch mark coins from both regions, gives additional weight to this. There are minor signs of Southeast Asian settlers, probably some adrift from the main group of Austronesian reed boat migrants that settled Madagascar. The earliest written history of the Maldives is marked by the arrival of Sinhalese people, who were descended from the exiled Magadha Prince Vijaya from the ancient city known as Sinhapura in northeast India. He and his party of several hundred landed in Sri Lanka, and some in the Maldives circa 543-483 BC. According to the Mahavansa, one of the ships that sailed with Prince Vijaya, who went to Sri Lanka around 500 BC, went adrift and arrived at an island called Mahiladvipika which is being identified with the Maldives. It is also said that at that time, the people from Mahiladvipika used to travel to Sri Lanka. 
Their settlement in Sri Lanka and the Maldives marks a significant change in demographics and the development of the Indo-Aryan language Divi, which is most similar in grammar, phonology, and structure to Sinhala, and especially to the more ancient Alu Prakrit, which has less Pali. Alternatively, it is believed that Vijaya and his clan came from western India, a claim supported by linguistic and cultural features, and specific descriptions in the epics themselves, for example that Vijaya visited Barukaka in his ship on the voyage down south. Philostorgius, a Greek historian of late antiquity, wrote of a hostage among the Romans, from the island called Diva, which is presumed to be the Maldives, who was baptized Theophilus. Theophilus was sent in the 350s to convert the Himyarites to Christianity, and went to his homeland from Arabia. He returned to Arabia, visited Aksum, and settled in Antioch. Buddhist period. Despite being just mentioned briefly in most history books, the 1,400-year-long Buddhist period has a foundational importance in the history of the Maldives. It was during this period that the culture of the Maldives as we now know it both developed and flourished. The Maldivian language, the first Maldive scripts, the architecture, the ruling institutions, the customs and manners of the Maldivians originated at the time when the Maldives were a Buddhist kingdom. Before embracing Buddhism as their way of life, Maldivians had practiced an ancient form of Hinduism, ritualistic traditions known as Srauta, in the form of venerating the Surya. Buddhism probably spread to the Maldives in the 3rd century BC, at the time of Ahsoka. Nearly all archaeological remains in the Maldives are from Buddhist stupas and monasteries, and all artifacts found to date display characteristic Buddhist iconography. Buddhist temples were mandala-shaped, they are oriented according to the four cardinal points, the main gate being towards the east. Since building space and materials were scarce, Maldivians constructed their places of worship on the foundations of previous buildings. The ancient Buddhist stupas are called Havada, Hadalai or Uschubu by the Maldivians according to the different atolls. These stupas and other archaeological remains, like foundations of Buddhist buildings Bihara, compound walls and stone baths, are found on many islands of the Maldives. They usually lie buried under mounds of sand and covered by vegetation. Local historian Hassan Ahmed Maniku counted as many as 59 islands with Buddhist archaeological sites in a provisional list he published in 1990. The largest monuments of the Buddhist era are in the islands fringing the eastern side of Ahadhan Mahdi Atoll. In the early 11th century, the Minikoi and Thiladhan Mahdi, and possibly other northern atolls, were conquered by the medieval Kola Tamil emperor Raja Raja Kola I, thus becoming a part of the Kola Empire. Unification of the archipelago is traditionally attributed to King Koamala. According to a legend from Maldivian folklore, in the early 12th century AD, a medieval prince named Koamala, a nobleman of the lion race from Sri Lanka, sailed to Raskethimu Island in the north Malhos Madulu Atoll, and from there to Mali, and established a kingdom, named Tiva Mari Kingdom. By then, the Adiata dynasty had for some time ceased to rule in Mali, possibly because of invasions by the Cholas of southern India in the 10th century. Koamala Kalu, who reigned as King Manabarana, was a king of the Homa dynasty, which some historians call the House of the Muge. The Homa dynasty sovereigns intermarried with the Adida dynasty. This is why the formal titles of Maldive kings until 1968 contained references to Kula Suda Ira, which means descended from the moon and the sun. No official record exists of the Adiata dynasty's reign. Since Koamala's reign, the Maldive throne was also known as the Singhashana. Before then, and in some situations since, it was also known as the Serialis. Some historians credit Koamala with freeing the Maldives from Kola rule. The first archaeological study of the remains of early cultures in the Maldives began with the work of H. C. P. Bell, a British commissioner of the Ceylon Civil Service. Bell was first ordered to the islands in late 1879 he returned twice to the Maldives to investigate ancient ruins. He studied the ancient mounds, called Havada or Uschubu by the Maldivians, which are found on many of the atolls. Early scholars like H. C. P. Bell, who resided in Sri Lanka most of his life, claim that Buddhism came to the Maldives from Sri Lanka and that the ancient Maldivians had followed Theravada Buddhism. Since then, New archaeological discoveries point to Mahayana and Vahrayana Buddhist influences, which are likely to have come to the island straight from the subcontinent. An urn discovered in Malhos in the 1980s has a Vishvavajra inscribed with Proto-Bengali script. 
This text was in the same script used in the ancient Buddhist centers of learning in Nalanda and Vikramashala. There is also a small porite stupa in the museum where the directional Dhyani Buddhas are etched in its four cardinal points as in the Mahayana tradition. Some coral blocks with fearsome heads of guardians are also displaying Varayana iconography. All these relatively recent archaeological discoveries are today exhibited in a side room of the small national museum and mail along with other artifacts. Buddhist remains have been also found in Minikoi Island, then part of the Maldive Kingdom, by the Archaeological Survey of India, in the latter half of the 20th century. Among these remains a Buddha head and stone foundations of a Vihara deserve special mention. In the mid-1980s, the Maldivian government allowed the popular Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl, to excavate ancient sites. Despite the clear evidence that all the ancient ruins in Maldives are Buddhist, Heyerdahl claimed that early sun-worshipping seafarers, called the Reden, first settled on the islands. Keeping up with his sensationalist style, Heyerdahl argued that Reden were people coming from somewhere else, whereas an ancient Maldivian poem says, Habita ua haudahau, Reden tanik hadi hau. This poem gives us a clue about the name Reden. According to Mahieja Rouge Ibrahim Didi, a learned man from Fuva Malaku, it was merely the name which the converted Maldivians used to refer to their infidel ancestors after the general conversion from Buddhism to Islam. Islamic Period Introduction of Islam The importance of the Arabs as traders in the Indian Ocean by the 12th century may partly explain why the last Buddhist king of Maldives Dovami converted to Islam in the year 1153. The king thereupon adopted the Muslim title and name of Sultan Muhammad ibn Abdullah, initiating a series of six Islamic dynasties consisting of 84 sultans and sultanas that lasted until 1932 when the sultanate became elective. The formal title of the sultan up to 1965 was, Sultan of Land and Sea, Lord of the Twelve Thousand Islands and Sultan of the Maldives which came with the style highness. The person traditionally deemed responsible for this conversion was a Sunni Muslim visitor named Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbarai. His venerated tomb now stands on the grounds of Medhu Ziyari across the street from the Hakuru Mosque in the capital Mali. Built in 1656, this is the oldest mosque in Maldives. Following the Islamic concept that before Islam there was the time of Jahiliya, in the history books used by Maldivians the introduction of Islam at the end of the 12th century is considered the cornerstone of the country's history. Compared to the other areas of South Asia, the conversion of the Maldives to Islam happened relatively late. Arab traders had converted populations in the Malabar coast since the 7th century, and the Arab conqueror Muhammad bin Qasim had converted large swathes of Sindh to Islam at about the same time. The Maldives remained a Buddhist kingdom for another 500 years until the conversion to Islam. The document known as Don Bidhu Lomafanu gives information about the suppression of Buddhism in the southern Hedhan Mahdi Atoll, which had been a major center of that religion. Monks were taken to mail and beheaded, the Satihiru Talu were broken to disfigure the numerous stupasm and the statues of Virachana, the transcendent Buddha of the Middle World region, were destroyed. Arab interest in Maldives also was reflected in the residence there in the 1340s of Ibn Battuta. The well-known North African traveler wrote how a Moroccan, one Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbarai, was believed to have been responsible for spreading Islam in the islands, reportedly convincing the local king after having subdued Ranamari, a demon coming from the sea. Even though this report has been contested in later sources, it does explain some crucial aspects of Maldivian culture. For instance, Historically Arabic has been the prime language of administration there, instead of the Persian and Urdu languages used in the nearby Muslim states. Another link to North Africa was the Maliki school of jurisprudence, used throughout most of North Africa, which was the official one in the Maldives until the 17th century. Somali Muslim Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbarai, also known as al barqatul is traditionally credited for this conversion. According to the story told to Ibn Battuta, a mosque was built with the inscription, the Sultan Ahmad Shinuraza accepted Islam at the hand of Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbarai. Some scholars have suggested the possibility of Ibn Battuta misreading Maldive texts, and having a bias towards the North African, Maghrebi narrative of this sheikh, instead of the East African origins account that was known as well at the time. Even when Ibn Battuta visited the islands, the governor of the island at that time was Abid Aziz al-Magadishawi, a Somali. 
scholars have posited another scenario where Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbari might have been a native of Barbera, a significant trading port on the northwestern coast of Somalia. Barbara or Barbaroi, as the ancestors of the Somalis were referred to by medieval Arab and ancient Greek geographers, respectively. This is also seen when Ibn Battuta visited Mogadishu, he mentions that the sultan at that time, Abu Bekr ibn Sheikh Omar, was a Berber. According to scholars, Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbari was Yusuf bin Ahmad al khanan a famous native Somali scholar known for establishing the Walashma dynasty of the Horn of Africa. After his conversion of the population of Dagar, a town in Somalia, he is also credited to have been responsible for spreading Islam in the Maldivian islands, establishing the Hakuru Miski, and converting the Maldivian population to Islam. Ibn Battuta states the Maldivian king was converted by Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbari. Another interpretation, held by the more reliable local historical chronicles, Radavali and Tariq, is that Abu al-Barakat Yusuf al-Barbari was an Iranian from Tabriz called Yusuf Shamsuddin, also locally known as Tabrizushbanu. In the Arabic script the words al-Barbari and al-Tabrizi are very much alike, owing to the fact that at the time, Arabic had several consonants that looked identical and could only be differentiated by overall context. The first reference to an Iranian origin dates to an 18th century Persian text, Kauri Shells and Khoir Trade. Inhabitants of the Middle East became interested in Maldives due to its strategic location. Middle Eastern seafarers had just begun to take over the Indian Ocean trade routes in the 10th century and found Maldives to be an important link in those routes. The Maldives was the first landfall for traders from Basra, sailing to Sri Lanka or Southeast Asia. Bengal was one of the principal trading partners of the Maldives. Trade involved mainly cowrie shells and coir fiber. The Maldives had an abundant supply of cowrie shells, a form of currency that was widely used throughout Asia and parts of the East African coast since ancient times. Shell currency imported from the Maldives was used as legal tender in the Bengal Sultanate and Mughal Bengal alongside gold and silver. The Maldives received rice in exchange for cowrie shells. The Bengal Maldives cowrie shell trade was the largest shell currency trade network in history. In the Maldives, ships could take on fresh water, fruit and the delicious, basket-smoked red flesh of the black bonito, a delicacy exported to Sindh, China, and Yemen. The people of the archipelago were described as gentle, civilized and hospitable. They produced brass utensils as well as fine cotton textiles, exported in the form of sarongs and turban lengths. These local industries must have depended on imported raw materials. The other essential product of the Maldives was coir, the fiber of the dried coconut husk. Cured in pits, beaten, spun and then twisted into cordage and ropes, coir's salient quality is its resistance to salt water. It stitched together and rigged the dows that plied the Indian Ocean. Maldivian coir was exported to Sindh, China, Yemen, and the Persian Gulf. It is stronger than hemp, wrote Ibn Battuta, and is used to sew together the planks of Sindhi and Yemeni dows, for this sea abounds in reefs, and if the planks were fastened with iron nails, they would break into pieces when the vessel hit a rock. The coir gives the boat greater elasticity, so that it doesn't break up. Colonial Period Portuguese and Dutch Hegemony in 1558 the Portuguese established a small garrison with a viador, or overseer of a factory in the Maldives, which they administered from their main colony in Goa. They tried to impose Christianity on the locals. Thus, 15 years later, a local leader named Muhammad Thakarufanu al-Azam and his two brothers organized a popular revolt and drove the Portuguese out of Maldives. This event is now commemorated as National Day and a small museum and memorial center honor the hero on his home island of Utimu on North Thilidhumadi Atoll. In the mid-17th century, the Dutch, who had replaced the Portuguese as the dominant power in Ceylon, established hegemony over Maldivian affairs without involving themselves directly in local matters, which were governed according to centuries-old Islamic customs, British protectorate. The British expelled the Dutch from Ceylon in 1796 and included Maldives as a protectorate. Britain got entangled with the Maldives as a result of domestic disturbances which targeted the settler community of Bora merchants who were British subjects in the 1860s. Rivalry between two dominant families, the Atharij clan and the Kakaaj clan was resolved with former winning the favor of the British authorities in Ceylon. 
The status of Maldives as a British protectorate was officially recorded in an 1887 agreement. On December 16, 1887, the Sultan of the Maldives signed a contract with the British governor of Ceylon turning the Maldives into a British protected state, thus giving up the island's sovereignty in matters of foreign policy, but retaining internal self-government. The British government promised military protection and non-interference in local administration, which continued to be regulated by Muslim traditional institutions, in exchange for an annual tribute. The status of the islands was akin to other British protectorates in the Indian Ocean region, including Zanzibar and the Trucial states. During the British era, which lasted until 1965, Maldives continued to be ruled under a succession of sultans. It was a period during which the sultan's authority and powers were increasingly and decisively taken over by the chief minister, much to the chagrin of the British governor-general who continued to deal with the ineffectual sultan. Consequently, Britain encouraged the development of a constitutional monarchy, and the first constitution was proclaimed in 1932. However, the new arrangements favored neither the aging sultan nor the wily chief minister, but rather a young crop of British-educated reformists. As a result, angry mobs were instigated against the constitution, which was publicly torn up. The Maldives were only marginally touched by the Second World War. The Italian auxiliary cruiser Rombi was sunk off Adu Atoll in 1941. After the death of Sultan Majid Didi and his son, the members of the parliament elected Muhammad Amin Didi as the next person in line to succeed the Sultan. But Didi refused to take up the throne. So, a referendum was held and Maldives became a republic, with Amin Didi as first elected president, having abolished the 812-year-old Sultanate. While serving as prime minister during the 1940s, Didi had nationalized the fish export industry. As president he is remembered as a reformer of the education system and a promoter of women's rights. Yet, while he was in Ceylon for medical treatment, a revolution was brought by the people of Mali, headed by his deputy Vilanaji Ibrahim Didi. When Amin did return he was confined to Dunadhu Island. He escaped to Mali and tried to take control of Bandiraj, but was beaten by an angry mob and died soon after. After the fall of President Muhammad Amin Didi, a referendum was held and 98% of the people voted in favor of restoration of the monarchy, so the country was again declared a sultanate. A new people's majlis was elected, as the former had been dissolved after the end of the revolution. The members of the special majlis decided to take a secret vote to elect a sultan, and Prince Muhammad Farid Didi was elected as the 84th sultan in 1954. His first prime minister was Egum Yuji Ibrahim Ali Didi. On December 11, 1957, the prime minister was forced to resign and Bailanaji Ibrahim Nasir was elected as the new prime minister the following day. British Military Presence and Suvadib Secession Beginning in the 1950s, political history in Maldives was largely influenced by the British military presence in the islands. In 1954 the restoration of the Sultanate perpetuated the rule of the past. Two years later, the United Kingdom obtained permission to re-establish its wartime RAF Gone airfield in the southernmost Adu Atoll, employing hundreds of locals. Maldives granted the British a 100-year lease on Gone that required them to pay £2,000 a year, as well as some 440,000 square meters on Hatadu for radio installations. This served as a staging post for British military flights to the Far East and Australia, replacing RAF Morapur in Pakistan which had been relinquished in 1956. In 1957, however, the new Prime Minister, Ibrahim Nasir, called for a review of the agreement in the interest of shortening the lease and increasing the annual payment, and announced a new tax on boats. But Nasir was challenged in 1959 by a local secessionist movement in the three southernmost atolls that benefited economically from the British presence on Gone. This group cut ties with the Maldives government and formed an independent state, the United Suvadiv Republic with Abdullah Afif as president and Hithadu as capital. The short-lived state had a combined population of 20,000 inhabitants scattered over Huvadu, Adu, and Fua Malaku. Afif pleaded for support and recognition from Britain in the edition of May 25, 1959 of the Times of London instead the initial British measure of lukewarm support for the small breakaway nation was withdrawn in 1961 when the British signed a treaty with the Maldive Islands without involving Afif. Following that treaty the Suvadives had to endure an economic embargo. In 1962 Nasir sent gunboats from Mali with government police on board to eliminate elements opposed to his rule. 
One year later the Subadive Republic was scrapped and Abdullah Afif went into exile to the Seychelles, where he died in 1993. Meanwhile, in 1960 the Maldives had allowed the United Kingdom to continue to use both the Ghanan and the Hatadu facilities for a 30-year period, with a payment of £750,000 over the period of 1960 to 1965 for the purpose of Maldives' economic development. The base was closed in 1976 as part of the larger British withdrawal of permanently stationed forces east of Suez initiated by Labour government of Harold Wilson. Independence On July 26, 1965, Maldives gained independence under an agreement signed with United Kingdom. The British government retained the use of the Ghan and Hatadu facilities. In a national referendum in March 1968, Maldivians abolished the Sultanate and established a republic. In line with the broader British policy of decolonization on July 26, 1965 an agreement was signed on behalf of His Majesty the Sultan by Ibrahim Nasir Ranabandiri Kalajefen, Prime Minister, and on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen by Sir Michael Walker, British Ambassador Designate to the Maldive Islands, which ended the British responsibility for the defense and external affairs of the Maldives. The islands thus achieved full political independence, with the ceremony taking place at the British High Commissioner's residence in Colombo. After this, the Sultanate continued for another three years under Muhammad Farid Didi, who declared himself king rather than sultan. On November 15, 1967, a vote was taken in Parliament to decide whether the Maldives should continue as a constitutional monarchy or become a republic. Of the 44 members of Parliament, 40 voted in favor of a republic. On March 15, 1968, a national referendum was held on the question, and 81.23% of those taking part voted in favor of establishing a republic. The republic was declared on November 11, 1968, thus ending the 853-year-old monarchy, which was replaced by a republic under the presidency of Ibrahim Nasir, the former prime minister. As the king had held little real power, this was seen as a cosmetic change and required few alterations in the structures of government. Nasir Presidency the Second Republic was proclaimed in November 1968 under the presidency of Ibrahim Nasir, who had increasingly dominated the political scene. Under the new constitution, Nasir was elected indirectly to a four-year presidential term by the Majlis and his candidacy later ratified by referendum. He appointed Ahmed Zaki as the new prime minister. In 1973 Nasir was elected to a second term under the constitution as amended in 1972, which extended the presidential term to five years and which also provided for the election of the Prime Minister by the Majlis. In March 1975, newly elected Prime Minister Zaki was arrested in a bloodless coup and was banished to a remote atoll. Observers suggested that Zaki was becoming too popular and hence posed a threat to the Nasir faction. During the 1970s, the economic situation in Maldives suffered a setback when the Sri Lankan market for Maldives' main export of dried fish collapsed. Adding to the problems was the British decision in 1975 to close its airfield on Gaon. A steep commercial decline followed the evacuation of Gaon in March 1976. As a result, the popularity of Nasir's government suffered. Maldives's 20-year period of authoritarian rule under Nasir abruptly ended in 1978 when he fled to Singapore. A subsequent investigation claimed that he had absconded with millions of dollars from the state treasury. However, there has been no evidence so far and as a result it was believed that this was a propaganda act of the new government to get popularity and support among the citizens. Nasir is widely credited with modernizing the long-isolated and nearly unknown Maldives and opening them up to the rest of the world, including by building the first international airport and bringing the Maldives to United Nations membership. He laid the foundations of the nation by modernizing the fisheries industry with mechanized vessels and starting the tourism industry, the two prime drivers of today's Maldivian economy. He was credited with many other improvements such as introducing an English-based modern curriculum to government-run schools and granting vote to Maldivian women in 1964. He brought television and radio to the country with formation of Television Maldives and Radio Maldives for broadcasting radio signals nationwide. He abolished VARU attacks on the people living on islands outside Mali. Tourism in the Maldives began to be developed by the beginning of the 1970s. The first resort in the Maldives was Kurumba Maldives which welcomed the first guests on October 3, 1972. 
The first accurate census was held in December 1977 and showed 142,832 persons residing in Maldives. When Nasir relinquished power Maldives was debt-free and the national shipping line with more than 40 ships remained a source of national pride. Nasir was criticized for his authoritarian methods against opponents and for his iron-fisted methods in handling an insurrection by the Adu Islanders who formed a short-lived breakaway government, United Suvadives Republic, with closer ties to the British. Nasir's hasty introduction of a Latin alphabet in 1976 instead of local Tana script, reportedly to allow for the use of telex machines in the local administration, was widely criticized. Clarence Maloney, a Maldives-based U.S. anthropologist, lamented the inconsistencies of the Divi Latin which ignored all previous linguistic research on the Maldivian language and did not follow the modern standard Indic transliteration. At the time of the Romanization every island's officials were required to use only one script and they became illiterate overnight. Officials were relieved when the Tana script was reinstated by President Malmoon shortly after he took power in 1978. However, Mali Latin continues to be widely used. Malmoon Presidency as Ibrahim Nasir's second term was coming to an end, he decided not to seek re-election and, in June 1978, the Majlis was called upon to nominate a presidential candidate. Nasir received 45 votes, with the remaining three votes for Mamoun Abdul Gayum, a former university lecturer and Maldivian ambassador to the United Nations. Another ballot was called on 16th of June. Mamoun received 27 votes, allowing his name to be put forward as the sole candidate. Five months later, he was elected the new president of the Maldives, with 92.96% of the votes. The peaceful election was seen as ushering in a period of political stability and economic development in view of Mamoun's priority to develop the poorer islands. In 1978 Maldives joined the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Tourism also gained an importance to the local economy, reaching more than 120,000 visitors in 1985. The local populace appeared to benefit from increased tourism and the corresponding increase in foreign contacts involving various development projects. There were three attempts by Nasir supporters and business interests to overthrow Mamoun's government during the 1980s, in 1980, 1983 and 1988. Whereas the 1980 and 1983 coup attempts against Mamoun's presidency were not considered serious, the third coup attempt in November 1988 alarmed the international community as about 80 armed mercenaries of the Plote Tamil militant group landed on Mali before dawn aboard used cargo vessels which had taken almost two days to arrive mail and failed in controlling the capital city. The plan was ill-prepared and by noon the Plote militants and the Maldivian allies fled the country realizing they had already lost. Soon after the militants had left the Indian military arrived on the request of President Gayum, and their gunships chased the ships that were been used as getaway boats by the Plote militants. 19 people died in the fighting, and several taken hostage also died when the Indian gunships fired on the vessel carrying the hostages. Mercenaries, and later also the mastermind of the attempted coup, were tried and sentenced to death, later commuted to life in prison. Some were later pardoned. Despite coup attempts, Ma Moon served three more presidential terms. In the 1983, 1988, and 1993 elections, Mamun received more than 90% of the vote. Although the government did not allow any legal opposition, Mamun was opposed in the early 1990s by the growth of Islamist radicalization and by some powerful local business leaders. Mamun's tenure was marked by several allegations of corruption as well as allegations of autocratic rule, human rights abuses and corruption. Mamun's opponents and international human rights groups had accused him of employing terror tactics against dissidents, such as arbitrary arrests, detention without trial, employing torture, forced confessions, and politically motivated killings. 21st Century Democratization During the later part of Mamun's rule, independent political movements emerged in Maldives, which challenged the then-ruling Divi Rai Thunj party and demanded democratic reform. Since 2003, following the death in custody of a prisoner, Nassim, the Maldives experienced several anti-government demonstrations calling for political reforms, more freedoms, and an end to torture and oppression. The dissident journalist Mohamed Nasheed rose to challenge the autocratic rule of Mamoun. Nasheed was imprisoned a total of 16 times under Mamoun's rule. Persisting in his activism, 
He founded the Maldivian Democratic Party in 2003 while in exile. His activism, as well as civil unrest that year, pressured Mamun into allowing for gradual political reforms. Violent protests broke out in Mali on September 20, 2003 after Evan Nassim, a prisoner, was killed in Mafushi prison, after the most brutal torture, by prison staff. An attempt to cover up the death was foiled when the mother of the dead man discovered the marks of torture on his body and made the knowledge public, therefore triggering the riots. A subsequent disturbance at the prison resulted in three deaths when police guards at the prison opened fire on unarmed inmates. Several government buildings were set on fire during the riots. As a result of pressure from reformists, the junior prison guards responsible for Nassim's death were subsequently tried, convicted and sentenced in 2005 in what was believed to be a show trial that avoided the senior officers involved being investigated. The report of an inquiry into the prison shootings was heavily censored by the government, citing national security grounds. Pro-reformists claim this was in order to cover up the chain of authority and circumstances that led to the killings. There were fresh protests in the capital city of Maldives, Mali on August 13, 2004, which appeared to have begun as a demand for the release of four political activists from detention. Beginning on the evening of August 12, 2004, up to 5,000 demonstrators got involved. This unplanned and unorganized demonstration was the largest such protest in the country's history. Protesters initially demanding the freeing of the pro-reformists arrested on the afternoon of August 12, 2004. As the protests continued to grow, people demanded the resignation of President Mamoun Abdel Gayoum, who had been in power since 1978. What started as a peaceful demonstration ended after 22 hours, as the country's darkest day in recent history. Several people were severely injured as personnel from the Maldivian National Security Service, later Maldivian National Defense Force, used riot batons and tear gas on unarmed civilians, after two police officers were reportedly stabbed, allegedly by government agents provocateurs, President Mamoun declared a state of emergency and suppressed the demonstration, suspending all human rights guaranteed under the constitution, banning demonstrations and the expression of views critical of the government. At least 250 pro-reform protesters were arrested. As part of the state of emergency, and to prevent independent reporting of events, the government shut off internet access and some mobile telephony services to Maldives on 13 and August 14, 2004. As a result of these activities, political parties were eventually allowed in June 2005. The main parties registered in Maldives are, the Maldivian Democratic Party, the Divi Rewi Thunj Party, the Islamic Democratic Party and the Ad Halath Party, also known as the Ad Halath Party. The first party to register was the MDP headed by popular opposition figures such as Mohamed Nasheed and Mohamed Latif. The next was the Divi Rewi Thunj Party headed by then-President Mamoun. New civil unrest broke out in Mali, Gayafu Dalu Atal and Adu Atal of the Maldives on August 12, 2005 which led to events that supported the democratic reform of the country. This unrest was provoked by the arrest of Mohamed Nasheed, an open critic of the President Mamoun Abdel Gayoum and the subsequent demolition of the Tunfini tent, used by the members of the Maldivian Democratic Party for their gatherings. Supporters of MDP were quick to demonstrate. They started calling for the resignation of Mamoun Abdel Gayoum, soon after Nasheed's arrest. Several arrests were made on the first night followed by the demolition of the Tunfini tent. The demolition complicated the situation further provoking the unrest. The unrest grew violent on the third night, on August 14, 2005 due to the methods used in the attempts by the authority to stop the demonstration. The unrest continued intermittently for three nights, from 12 to August 14, 2005. By August 15, 2005, the uprising was controlled with the presence of heavy security around Mali. Almost a fourth of the city had to be cordoned off during the unrest. Tsunami Impact On December 26, 2004, following the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake, the Maldives were devastated by a tsunami. Only nine islands were reported to have escaped any flooding, while 57 islands faced serious damage to critical infrastructure, 14 islands had to be totally evacuated, and six islands were destroyed. A further 21 resort islands were forced to close because of serious damage. The total damage was estimated at more than 400 million US dollars, or some 62% of the GDP. 102 Maldivians and six foreigners reportedly died in the tsunami. 
The destructive impact of the waves on the low-lying islands was mitigated by the fact there was no continental shelf or land mass upon which the waves could gain height. The tallest waves were reported to be 14 feet high, Nishid Presidency. The protest movements brought about significant change in political structure. A new constitution was ratified in August 2008, paving the way for the country's first multi-party presidential election two months later. Standing as the DRP candidate, Mahmoon lost in the election's second round, in which he received 45.75% of the vote against 54.25% for his opponents, MDP's presidential candidate Mohammad Nasheed accordingly succeeded Mahmoon as president on November 11, 2008, with Ghami Idihad's candidate Mohammad Wahid Hassan in the new post of vice president. The 2009 parliamentary election saw the Maldivian Democratic Party of President Nasheed receive the most votes with 30.81%, gaining 26 seats, although Mahmoon's MPP, with 24.62% of the vote, received the most seats. The government of President Mohammad Nasheed faced many challenges, including the huge debt left by the previous government, the economic downturn following the 2004 tsunami, overspending during his regime, unemployment, corruption, and increasing drug use. Taxation on goods was imposed for the first time in the country, and import duties were reduced in many goods and services. Social welfare benefits were given to those above 65 years of age, single parents, and those with special needs. On November 10, 2008, Nasheed announced an intent to create a sovereign wealth fund with money earned from tourism that could be used to purchase land elsewhere for the Maldives people to relocate should rising sea levels due to climate change inundate the country. The government reportedly considered locations in Sri Lanka and India due to cultural and climate similarities, and as far away as Australia. An October 2009 cabinet meeting was held underwater to publicize to the wider world the threat of global warming on the low-lying islands of the Maldives. A series of peaceful protests that broke out in the Maldives on May 1, 2011. They would continue, eventually escalating into the resignation of President Mohammad Nasheed in disputed circumstances in February 2012. Demonstrators were protesting what they considered the government's mismanagement of the economy and were calling for the ouster of President Mohammad Nasheed. The main political opposition party in the country, the Daivi Raithunj party led by former President Mahmoun Abdul Gayoum accused President Nasheed of talking about democracy but not putting it into practice. The primary cause for the protests was rising commodity prices and a poor economic situation in the country, Wahid Presidency. Nasheed resigned on February 7, 2012 following weeks of protests after he ordered the military to arrest Abdullah Mohammed, the chief justice of the criminal court on 16th of January. Maldives police joined the protesters after refusing to use force on them and took over the state-owned television station forcibly switching the broadcast opposition party leader Mahmoun Abdul Gayoum's call for people to come out to protest. The Maldives army then clashed with police and other protesters who were with the police. All this time no one of the protester tried to invade any security facility including headquarters of MNDF. The Chief Justice was released from detention after Nasheed resigned from his post. Vice President Mohammad Wahid Hassan Manik was sworn as the new President of Maldives. Former President Nasheed supporters clashed with the security personnel during a rally on July 12, 2012, seeking ouster of President Wahid. Nasheed stated the following day that he was forced out of office at gunpoint, while Wahid supporters maintained that the transfer of power was voluntary and constitutional. A later British Commonwealth meeting concluded that it could not determine conclusively the constitutionality of the resignation of President Nasheed, but called for an international investigation. The Maldives National Commission of Inquiry, appointed to investigate the matter, found that there was no evidence to support Nasheed's version of events. Many countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom, were quick to abandon Nasheed, instead endorsing his successor. On February 23, 2012, the Commonwealth suspended the Maldives from its democracy and human rights watchdog while the ousting was being investigated, and backed Nasheed's call for elections before the end of 2012. On 8 October, Nasheed was arrested after failing to appear in court to face charges that he ordered the illegal arrest of a judge while in office. However, his supporters claim that this detention was politically motivated in order to prevent him from campaigning for the 2013 presidential elections. In March 2013 the former President Nasheed was convicted under the country's terrorism laws for ordering the arrest of an allegedly corrupt judge in 2012 and jailed for 13 years. 
Maldives international partners, including the EU, US, UK and the United Nations, have said his rush trial was seriously flawed following a UN panel ruling in the former president's favor. The UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has called for his immediate release. Nasheed appealed also to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Yamin Presidency. At the time Nasheed was jailed, President Mohammad Wahid Hassan announced a presidential election would be held in 2013. The elections in late 2013 were highly contested. Former President Mohammad Nasheed won the most votes in the first round. Contrary to the assessment of international election observers, the Supreme Court cited irregularities and annulled it. In the end, the opposition combined to gain a majority. Abdullah Yamin, half-brother of the former President Mamoun, assumed the presidency. Yamin implemented a foreign policy shift towards increased engagement with China, establishing diplomatic relations between the two countries. Yamin employed Islam as a tool of identity politics, framing religious mobilization as the solution to perceived Western attempts to undermine Maldivian national sovereignty. Yamin's policy of connecting Islam with anti-Western rhetoric represented a new development. On September 28, 2015 there was an assassination attempt on President Abdullah Yamin as he was returning from Saudi Arabia after the Hajj pilgrimage. As his speedboat was docking at mail there was an explosion on board. Amid screams, the right door of the boat fell on the jetty and there was heavy smoke. Three people were injured, including his wife, but the president managed to escape unhurt. In a probe of the explosion targeting president, on October 24, 2015 Maldives Vice President Ahmed Adib was arrested at the airport upon his return from a conference in China. Seventeen of Adhib's supporters were also arrested for public order offenses. The government instituted a broader crackdown against political dissent. On November 4, 2015, President Abdullah Yamin declared a 30-day state of emergency ahead of a planned anti-government rally. The next day, as per the state of emergency bill made by the president, the People's Majlis decided to rush the process for the removal of Vice President Ahmed Adib by a no-confidence vote that was submitted by PPM Parliament than the originally intended period. As a result, the Majlis passed the no-confidence vote with a majority of 61 members favoring it, removing Adib from the post of Vice President in the process. On November 10, 2015, President Yamin revoked the state of emergency citing that no imminent threats remained in the country. Growth of Islamic Radicalism Though the popular image of the Maldives is that of a holiday paradise, its radicalized youths are enlisting in significant numbers to fight for Islamic State militants in the Middle East. In the late 1990s Wahhabism challenged more traditional moderate practices. After the 2004 tsunami, Saudi-funded preachers gained influence. Within a short period of a decade fundamentalist practices dominated the culture. The Guardian estimates that 50 to 100 fighters have joined ISIS and Al-Qaeda from the Maldives. The Financial Times puts the number at 200. Most radicals are young men who suffer from lethargy, unemployment, drug abuse, and the need to prove their masculinity. Radicalization often happens in jail where the only thing to read is the Quran or religious literature. There are also lots of older militants and young guys look up to them. Ibrahim Mohamed Soli Presidency Ibrahim Mohamed Soli was selected as the new presidential candidate for the coalition of opposition parties in the 2018 election, when former President Mohamed Nasheed changed his mind about running. In the 2018 elections Ibrahim Mohamed Soli won the most votes, and he sworn in as the Maldives' new president on November 17, 2018, when the five-year term of Abdullah Yamin expired. Soli became the seventh president of the Maldives and the country's third democratically elected president. He promised to fight against widespread corruption and investigate the human rights abuses of the previous regime. There was also a change in foreign relations. His predecessor Abdullah Yamin was politically very close to China with some anti-India attitude, but President Soli reaffirmed previous India First policy, and Maldives and India strengthened their close relationship. On November 19, 2018, Soli announced that the Maldives is to return to the Commonwealth of Nations, a decision recommended by his cabinet, considering that the Maldives was a Commonwealth Republic from 1982 to 2016. In April 2019 parliamentary election the Maldivian Democratic Party of President Ibrahim Mohamed Soli won a landslide victory. It took 65 of 87 seats of the parliament. 
This was the first time a single party was able to get such a high number of seats in the parliament in Maldivian history. Former President Abdullah Yamin was sentenced to five years in prison in November 2019 for money laundering. The High Court upheld the jail sentence in January 2021.